Greetings, freaks and geeks. Welcome to the Square Round Table podcast. Thank you for joining us tonight. Tonight's guest is a multifaceted visual artist and illustrator responsible for creating some truly groundbreaking works throughout her career. And we're, all, and we're so elated to chat with her tonight. Please welcome Miss Mary Grandfrey. Hey, thanks, guys. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you. It's great to be here. Yes. Thank you. I'm glad you. Thanks for coming out. Yeah. But before we get started, I like to have a little mental health check with all of our guests. Just how's everything been? Because I know it's been crazy with this COVID and the weather. And I just like to know how you've just been matriculating through stuff like that. I, for me, I've been just really enjoying just being able to come to the studio and create. It's my, it's my oasis when things are crazy out in the world. For whatever reason, being a creator, being a painter now, I'm an abstract painter now. I can just come out and play and still taking care of family stuff and the regular day-to-day business. But painting is my mental health support. It's my it's my drug. Yes, that's a good drug to have. As a fellow artist, that's a great drug to have. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So I'm good. <laughs> that's good. That's good. What Marcus said, like it's me and Marcus are actually artists and we both use art as a means to get away from everything too. But as far as painting, the thing about this art is this me personally, like I, in saying that I use art as a means to get away from everything, like this has always been pretty meaningful to me. And what was your process in being able to yeah. just to ex- express yourself? And being able to get away from things because I just get a little jumbled up about it sometimes because it's like very specific things that I do well, in the ways that I feel. There's certain things that I portray in my drawings. And what's your process? It's That's a great question because for the first like 30 years of my art life, my, my cur- a, adult career of being an artist, I was an illustrator. So that's been a different process for me for a long time because as an illustrator, you're working with a writer or an art director or creative, or, and you're working on somebody else's story, usually. I was a children's book illustrator. And so the process there was to just get the manuscript, read the work, and decide if it's really a good fit for you as an illustrator, because some of the stuff that would come across my desk would be stories that I couldn't feel anything for, I didn't care about, I didn't want to draw pictures for this thing because I don't even care about it. And so I wouldn't do it much justice if I was illustrating something that my heart wasn't in. So just choosing the right jobs, if you have that privilege to choose, if you're busy enough to choose. So finding that and then getting a real good grasp of the story and the characters and a lot of work just sketching through that, but just with a pencil and paper, just finding the fit for the right words and telling the story visually. So that that was a real organized process as an illustrator. But as an abstract painter, it's different because what I do as an abstract painter is I just start building up the surface with collage and a lot of glue and newspaper and pictures and all kinds of stuff. And I don't have any plan. And that's where the fun part comes in. It's just playing. And eventually, though, you have to become a designer and you have to start picking out ways to make this thing balanced or composed right so the eye flows around. There's still principles that you're using as an abstract painter that you used as an illustrator. You still have to make a good picture, even though it might be abstract. It still has to be right. So... The process is looser as an abstract painter, but there's still a set of principles to follow. And I think having been an illustrator for so long, I started to lose my joy about it after so many years. Mm -hmm. And also just telling stories that other people were, were writing. I wanted to come up with my own ideas and my own freedom and my own heart to create. And that's why abstraction and the abstract part really appealed to me because I just needed that freedom to paint what I wanted to, what I felt like painting. So it's a whole new playground and it's late in my life, but it's never too late to have fun. So, so that's that, that's, 
two processes, I guess I talked about a little bit, but yeah. That's great. Is that um, some of your work behind you right there on the wall? Yeah, that piece with that big waterfall falling down that guy. I don't know if you can see it here. I'll, yeah, we... I'll move it a little closer. That's in, That's not finished yet, but it's actually a piece for a friend of mine who has Parkinson's disease. And that he wrote, he's a writer too, and he wrote a series of poems to talk about his journey as a person with Parkinson's. And this particular piece is called The Verdict. And so we decided to show how it feels when you when the doctor says you have Parkinson's. So he said it felt like a tsunami was coming in and falling on wow. him. And wow. so that's a serious piece, but that's what that piece was about. And then, so that's more like an illustration actually. And then this next to it, those are just okay. like shapes and colors. And that was... That's what I do to just kind of loosen up. That's more of an abstract thing. So nice. they're very different from each other, but they come from the same the same place. I like to do things that are bold. And, mm, and yeah, I see. I can tell. I like how the contrast of the colors and the, the yeah. value of it and stuff is really. I love abstract stuff. That's some like my favorite art, especially when I was in college because I started as an art major. You know, I switched over to film, but got the minor in art. So yeah, I always keep that art near and dear to my heart. So I love, right? Like one of my favorite artists is a John Michael Basquiat. Oh, yeah. Cool. I like, mm -hmm. I, I even like Jackson Pollock stuff. I know they say it's just, it looks like just splashing paint, but hey, I liked it. <laughs> the more you learn about both of those artists, the more you appreciate their work. Yes. It's yes. not just sloppy, messy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was a process that they actually went went through and it was thought out before they even put the paint down. Yep. And that's, what's, that's just what's so cool about any kind of art. It's a process to everything. A lot of people think it's just you get a canvas and just start painting, but like you was just explaining to us, it's a process with that, just as a process to go draw for a comic book or a draw for an animated show. It's always a process with art. Yeah. So. It's like a journey, right? I mean, yeah, definitely. I don't even think of the final product. I think of how I get there. I feel exactly. while, while I'm getting there. What does it feel like to be on this path? It's a experience that should be joyful. Sometimes it's really frustrating, right? You just, mm -hmm. you're pulling your hair out because it doesn't look the way you want it to look. And then you have to stand back and realize maybe... I don't know what it should look like. Maybe yep. it's telling me what it should look like. Yep. So there's a lot of letting go too. I That's think. very true. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Definitely. And especially, that's partly why I get pretty jumbled up about describing art because much like Marcus, me personally, it means a lot to me. And depending on how I feel, I portray certain things. As soon as you told me, the backstory of verdict i already knew what the tsunami was supposed to represent because mm -hmm. anyone when you receive like some really bad news it feels mm -hmm. like you're stagnated and you're just just i don't know just mentally drifting yeah and i just think about it in terms of a tsunami and how it might feel being swallowed by one yeah. like you're just just going through the motions literally yeah. and i really yeah, and I really appreciate just being able to see that. Thank you. Yeah. I didn't really plan <clears throat> to talk about that. I put my work up around the studio and my studio is a total mess right now, but sometimes I have to leave the studio or turn a piece against the wall so I don't see it. I think there's this whole thing about stepping away from your work and letting mm -hmm. it rest and not looking at it or thinking about it so that it can just percolate, just have its own life without you interrupting it for a while and then come back to it fresh three days later and you'll see things in it you didn't notice before and you'll know what needs to be fixed or you'll see something that is really working that you didn't notice before and you'll work with that. So I always say that even when you're not in the studio or even when you've stepped away, your mind is still going like an artist and you're still working. Even yes. though you're not, you don't have a, pen, a pencil or a paintbrush in your hand, you're still working. You're still seeing. And then when you come back to it, it looks totally different. That's how my experience is, but everybody's different. Yeah, that's my process as well. Is your process the same with abstract paintings? Or do you ever step away from them and then you the think time. about something else? Oh, all the time. And I usually work on like six paintings at a time because they inform each other. Oh, wow, this color looks great over here. I wonder what it would look like over there. Hmm. And so I've got paintings. I have a small studio. There's three walls and there's 
paintings uh, on each wall. And so I can almost just pivot and go from painting to painting. And uh, sometimes they look real, like crap, but, and sometimes they look really great the next day. And now it almost depends what pair of glasses you put on or what your mindset is that day. Mm-hmm. Things look and how they feel. Definitely, definitely. I know earlier before we started, you were telling us about where you grew up and stuff and, you know, all that. And just, I know we we also interested in like how you got into art, what piqued your interest in it? Or was it always something you knew you wanted to do or did it come later on in life? How was that? Like, how was your process like coming up and growing up and where you were from and stuff? I'm from the mid, I'm from Minnesota. I'm in the Midwest, pretty hardworking family. We didn't have much money. And my dad was a carpenter. And so he built a lot of stuff. And so I would be down in the basement where he would work and he would build, it sounds corny, but he built wooden rocking horses for his okay. grandchildren, a little, they were cousins and, and he'd have me paint them. So I would paint the rocking horses and I just helped him down in his workshop quite a bit. And I got real used to the materials and being real physical and tactile with paintbrushes and stuff like that. And I even painted the house a few times, but, and he also drew, he, we, he would come home from work and we would sit at the table and draw together. So drawing always was with me. And I would say since I was five, maybe I was drawing all the time every day. It was like, it was already an oasis for me as a little kid. I had a hard time in, um, in grade school. Cause I got sick every day and I hated school for, the first seven years of school. And so drawing really was a savior for me, a saving grace for me. And I grew up in a Catholic school where the nuns were super strict and they tried to make me into a right-handed person because being right-handed is a way to be. All that (laughs) stuff that's just not even taught anymore. We've gotten past that at least. So drawing became a real personal expression for me and a really happy place for me. And Eventually, after many years of wait, waiting on tables just to support myself, I decided to go to art school and I went to the Minneapolis College of Art and Design and studied painting and illustration and design <clears throat> and uh, didn't have enough money to pay for a full four years. So I had to drop out early and took my portfolio out around the streets and got some jobs as an illustrator, freelancing. And I worked for magazines and did editorial work. And that was really fun because I got to come up with my own ideas, how to show. I worked for a medical magazine. And so you'd, mm. you'd had get articles that were weird and you had an article about bladder, bladder infections. And I, how do you uh, show, how do you illustrate bladder infections? I'm yeah. not going to illustrate some gross thing, but no, it was more about, like, I remember it was like, I made this painting of this woman from behind just sitting down she didn't have anything on but there were no parts showing but she had I put faucets on her on where her kidneys would be and there oh, so I did yeah. that kind of stuff so it was that editorial yeah. bent on day things and and then I did some ad work and design work and eventually some children's books so I got a lot of rejections from publishing houses for a couple of years or maybe three or four years. And, but finally I got my first children's book and that kind of opened the door for other children's books. People started to notice my work. And at the time I worked in pastels, which is a really delicate medium. And people would tell me, don't work in pastels. Nobody will hire you. That's all I did for 10 years and people were hiring me. So you can't listen to everybody all the time. You have to just listen to yourself and just do what's comfortable. Followed that path and worked on children's books for a really long time until I didn't want to anymore. That's yeah. awesome. Mm-hmm. Yes. It's funny too to hear you say you had to drop out of school because like a lot of, I know me and Josh can relate to the whole school and finances thing because that's a part of why I didn't go to art school at all because it was so much to go to art school so I just I had to figure out like my way and my path somewhere else because it's it's really hard to pay for art school oh it's terrible yeah it's so crazy so a lot of you people out there who don't know us artists we really we go through the motions and the notions to get to where we at especially when we try to get through school good news is if you work honestly 
as an artist, nobody's going to look to see if you have a degree or not. Lee. Yes. You just yes. need to show your portfolio and, and you need to move your ass off because you've got to improve yourself. No matter what kind of art you're making, you've got to work so hard all the time at it and have a portfolio that shines. And now there's back then we actually had large whole big portfolios with real paintings in them uh, <laughs> hanging around. Well, now you don't do that. You can, you've got all kinds of digital options. Exactly. Yeah. My husband, we, the reason we moved to Florida <clears throat> was because my husband got a job at uh, Ringling Art School down oh, here. Wow. It's, it's a good art school. And, and he was the illustration head of the department of the illustration department. And he's an artist too. But yeah, it's super expensive. I don't know how kids, a lot I'm of kids. You. <laughs> and some I'm kids go yeah. and don't really put their all into it. And it's just yeah. it's sad to see. But yeah, it is. Definitely yeah. agree. Yeah. No, definitely. But I also want to talk a little bit about how did you develop your art style? Because you were talking about how art, like you create an art and just peaceful for you. And I definitely get a little bit of that out of looking at your art because this looks extremely peaceful and nostalgic oh, wow. and warm. Thank you. I think it's I think it's developed and changed over time. I remember when I was first searching for a style, when I was just beginning to be an illustrator, the thing then was try to really stand out. There were times when people would tell you, do everything, do panic, do, you know, washy watercolor, do realism, do stylist stuff. And Honestly, that wasn't the way to do it. The way to go was to find something that really works for you and just really do it well, because doing a little bit of everything isn't going to make you stand out. So I remember just really being so <clears throat> torn about what could I do that would stand out. And I just remember how do I remember trying to find something that was comfortable that I could keep doing, because if you're forcing a style, it's not going to last long. And it's not going to be done well. And somebody else is going to do it better than you. And so I just tried to draw comfortably and with a rhythm and with a style. And pretty soon I realized, wow, I really like curves. And so I started drawing a lot of curvy things and elongated faces. And I called on myself to, or I thought about what artists do I really like? I really like Mondrian, or I like some of Picasso's stuff. I like that real whacked out stylist stuff. So I started drawing like that and combining my own kind of rhythm with it. And I, it just took a lot of time to really practice and be by yourself and figure out what was comfortable. And I just finally found it, but it, it took maybe two or three years to really find what worked for me. And when I found it, I just remember feeling ecstatic. I just found me. I just found, I finally found who I really was. And that stayed with me for quite a bit until it became old to me mm. and I was bored with it. And then I tried to get myself gradually into other things. So it changed through my career as an illustrator and it changes it even as an abstract painter, kind of think it changes. But I also think we as artists don't really see our work like other people see it. Um, I think other people can see a certain style in our work when we don't. Do you think that's Very true? true? Very yeah. true. Yeah, because I've had that a lot of times when I do certain stuff. It's like, oh, yeah, I see you got that kind of this and that style. Like, you was trying to do this and that. And sometimes I'll just be like, yeah, okay. <laughs> it happened a lot when I was in um, school. I was taking uh, my last semester. I took a watercolor class. I had never done watercolors before. So I had did a piece. And uh, my professor's like, oh, I see what you meant to do here. I love it. I was like, so that was that intentional or... I was like, yeah, it was, I guess. Yeah. I, at the time, I didn't look at it like that. I was just in the moment. But yeah, if that's what you want, okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, definitely. And yeah, I also think that people perceive art differently because you might draw one thing a certain kind of way and then they look at it a certain kind of way. But I think it's interesting because I think people also perceive art based on not only visually but i guess people's like individual experiences also have some kind of this have an influence on how they perceive art mm -hmm. and that is and that just thinks like stuff like that spills over to other things yeah i find that 
I don't, at least now as I'm older, I don't want to hear people's opinions about my work so much because it influences me too much. I hear somebody, even if they say they mm -hmm. like something, then I get stuck because I think, oh, I should do more of those. Yeah. You know, oh, that must be good then. So a compliment can be as dangerous or not as a diss on your work because it can throw you off and uh, prevent you from listening to yourself, I think. Yeah. That's, yeah. And I basically think the same way because that's pretty much why I said why it affects other things. Because if yeah. somebody says how they truly think about what they truly think about a piece of art that you did, you might take it to heart and you mm. might change your own perception. Yeah. And you might just keep playing it over and over in your head and you lose your own vision. Yes. And, that, and I know that happens to me personally. Yeah, it's tough. You have to be an island sometimes. You have to be in yourself. Mm -hmm. Being an artist is one of the most selfish things you can be. Yeah, it is. Yeah. I it's agree. True, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of jerks who are artists, or a lot of artists who are jerks. <laughs> <laughs> but they're good. They're yeah. It's hard. And as a mom, my husband and I are older parents. So he has he was previously married. So he has kids in their forties. And <clears throat> I'm, I'm older. And when I was 50, we adopted a girl from China and she's now graduating, going to college. So you can figure out my age. <laughs> but so having a child, a teenager, and you're trying to be an artist, it's hard because <laughs> being an artist, you got to come to the studio. You got to show up all the time. If you want to really do good work and you just, I, as a mom, I can't be in here all the time Yeah. because I want to be with my daughter and I want to help her through her stuff. And she's got her own stuff and every kid does, and you have to live your other parts of your life. And then, but the good news is too, that you can bring that into your work. There's a lot I'd like to say in my work about some of the stuff that I feel and see with the younger generation and the way things are going. And there's a whole new thing inside of me, even since I've been doing this work on Parkinson's disease that I feel like I want to make my art say something important um, and have more of a message than just abstract shapes and colors like that, which is fine. That's fine. That's valid. But for me right now in my life, I feel like I want to bring a different meaning to my art. I'm not sure what it is yet, but I know there's a lot of things to say. So Definitely. big for me to think about that and just to really to make a difference. I think we want to make a difference where we can, most and even if it's in our own little way. Yes, most definitely. That's great. So we like, we're really happy for you and that journey that you've taken. Cause that's a, a wonderful and a beautiful thing at the same time. Yeah, it is. It definitely is. And, um, and a lot of times it's hard to articulate exactly what you said. And me personally, mostly know your work from your Harry Potter covers. Yeah. And I have a lot of memories of those from when I was a kid and how I just loved how it's full of energy. This is so much energy that was in the drawings. And I just want to know if you feel like sharing what part. So where were you in your life when, like when you created those, were you still yeah. using pastels and stuff like yep. that? Yeah, I was still using pastels. Yeah, I was living in Minnesota at the time. So that was like way back then. That was like... I don't know, I guess it's, oh, it's, I think it's been 25 years since the first Potter cover came out. This was probably about 27 years ago when I got that first phone call from David Saylor at Scholastic in New York, and they had seen some of my children's books. And so he called and, and offered, or wondered if I'd be interested in illustrating the a cover of this book. There, he only had three books then there weren't going to be seven books. We didn't know about any of that. It was just all we knew at the time is that this person named J.K. Rowling was going to make three books about this boy with magical powers. And, and I was really busy at the time with other work, so I didn't want to take it. And I just told David, I don't think I can do it, but thanks for calling. And um, then he called back a little later and asked me to maybe think about it some more because he really liked this particular piece he saw that I did somewhere. Yeah. And so I said, okay, just send me the manuscript. I'll take a look. And so he sent me the manuscript in the mail and I got the stack of papers and read that was the story and I read through it and I actually really liked it. I don't really like magical stuff much, but I loved the vulnerability of this kid and the fact that he lived under the stairs and he had this 
really terrible life. I just felt really, I had some empathy for him and I just felt for him and I had this feeling about it. I said, okay, I'll do it. So I'm glad I said, yeah, because that really opened the door to a lot of things. So that was when I was busy doing other children's books and it really just took off after the third book. There were more books coming. I had no idea that was going to happen. And then it became almost bigger than just making art. It became this empire, <laughs> the <Yeah>. pot <laughs> and, and it became difficult in some ways, but it was really intense to get the phone call every year and say, okay, Mary, Harry's coming to town. You're going to get another manuscript. And I had to write in the contract that, yes, I had a safe place to put the manuscript that was locked away in a safe because there were mm. couldn't be any leaks or anything. And so it became a real kind of heavy thing and I always came around Christmas time for some reason and then <laughs> then I'd have to drop everything and really work on sketches they were the books got bigger and there's a lot more to read and there were all the chapter heading and all the chapter drawings too the black and white spots that I did and but the scholastic great, people were great to work with David has become a good friend of mine and Arthur Levine the editor a good friend so really met some nice people to work with and the whole the biggest gift for me personally was that I got to meet a lot of parents who had excited kids that would come through my book signing line and they'd talk about how their kids learned to read with Harry Potter. And it's fun to be part of something that's um, exciting for kids and helps them read and stuff. And then years later, the kids had grown up and they'd come through with their kids. It's, it's yeah. kind of cool that way. So yeah, that was definitely the most popular part of my career but creatively it wasn't my my personal highlight but it was the most well known I guess people think it's my the best part of my career and it is as far as meeting a lot of great people yeah. was exposed to a lot of wonderful opportunities but creatively not as much I think J.K. Rowling is a great author and she honestly illustrating for her writing was fun. The way she describes things, her characters, yeah. all the cool places and the environments. And that was fun. That was really fun. What would you say was like your most, your high point for like yourself as a, what, would, what was that? As an artist? Yes. My high point, what I'm doing now. That's awesome. That's awesome. And that's why I'm doing it, because I had yes. to find a better place. And I think that's what we all do as artists, right? No matter yes. what, no matter what we've done, if we're not looking for something more every day that we come into the studio or into wherever we paint or whatever we do, if we're not looking for something better, then, then we sink. Then it's then we're not happy. Mm -hmm. I think we always have to be doing something where we're exploring and trying to discover something new because that's what artists do. I think yes. they don't definitely. just repeat themselves. Yeah, definitely. definitely. Whether your music really inspires me and I love jazz and I love jazz because I love it because you don't know what's coming next. A lot of times you do, but that's what I feel like when I paint because I don't know what's going to show up. And when it comes to, when I see it, it's a surprise, yeah. it's a discovery, and that's exciting. And I like jazz too for me. Yes. That's yeah. a that's actually a great comparison to compare with a way you can do art because it is very similar. I never thought of that, thought of it like that until you said that. That's that is that's actually yeah. very a very great comparison. You know you love jazz. I love Yeah, it. I love jazz. I just like you said, I love how you can be here in one minute and then you can come here and come back down here but then you might come over here and then move over there and then at the end it just all crosses back over and it just goes down so I, yeah. it's almost like a it's like a jam session but they just recorded it and put it on a vinyl yeah i love it and that's like you said that's art you start here and then you end up totally somewhere else yeah it, it's definitely that's a good i'm gonna start using that now i'm gonna yeah. have to steal that one from you <laughs> Go ahead. you got it I, yeah i'm guessing a few artists feel that way about it about it it depends <laughs> on the music 
different people different ways and who knows i don't like to listen to music that has lyrics when i'm mm. working because i don't unless i'm looking for something but yeah i just want my head to be clear about that i don't want somebody else telling a story while i'm working there you go. There yeah. you go. how about you <laughs> Do you guys listen to certain kinds of music when you write? Yeah, I, it's funny because I do it with my writing and my art. Sometimes with art, I'll have something with some lyrics, but it just depends on what I'm working on or what mood I'm in. But I know a lot of times with my writing, I listen to like movie scores because I just love the sound of the orchestras and some of it, or some of it just epic. might be a bit, yeah, it's epic. So it'll get me, it'll get the blood flowing, I start feeling, especially if whatever I'm writing is in that genre or that subject, it'll really get my mind going. And then a lot of times when I write stuff like in a period, like if it's like the 1960s, I'll put like some jazz on, some Motown hits, a little classic rock, because it'll get me in the mindset of yeah. that era and I can really start going, so... Yeah. I, either way, I love to use music with my art, with whatever it is. So it yeah. is definitely a part of my creative process all the time. That's cool. Yeah, and the same with me. Speaking of jazz, it's funny you brought it up because when I'm, whenever I'm drawing or writing poetry, there's always this one jazz song that I put on pretty much every time <laughs> because I can never really pinpoint what's the next note because it's because it's just because it's kind of hard to like I said jazz is like really it can be really unpredictable yeah it's really abstract yeah 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 and there, yeah there's this one song that I always put on and not just with that but just yeah I just really love how unpredictable jazz is and sometimes I just listen to jazz albums all the way through and I just can't remember the album it's almost yeah. like I just didn't listen to it at all yeah same and yeah and and just circle back just circling back to art i wanted to understand how you were able to i don't know just create the identity of harry potter and be able to replicate that appearance over the years like just from yeah. just how you were able to create harry potter from nothing into who he is today and how you were able to consistently make him what he is yeah. what was the process i think it started with just really paying attention to how rowling described him and she's pretty she's pretty descriptive in her writing she gives you quite a bit to go for to go with and when i, I think when visual people like us when we read we see the pictures in our mind i could just see him as i read and and just started sketching i actually remember at the time I had super short hair, it was dark brown hair. And I remember I didn't have a model to work from for Harry when I was trying to figure out who he was in those first few drawings. Yeah. And so I took my sketch pad into the bathroom where I had this great big mirror and I set up my, my chair to sit on and I just did some self portraits to start to mm. get started just to have composition nose eye thing then I'll then I would change it and make it more boy like and so that's really how he started but I really tried to just pay attention to the how she described him and he's changed from scholastic hired new illustrators to do new covers and so they they showed him differently than I did. They moved the scar and the glasses were different and that's cool. I don't really care but we all have our different way of seeing him or our sub whatever our subject is we have a different way of seeing it it just took time and then the trick was for me it was to age him a year every time I did a cover and that's hard to age somebody a year that you made up oh, yeah. how does that work and I almost wish I was a who are those what do you call those artists who draw people the way they look like 10 in 10 years where I don't know wanted posters or whatever i don't know yeah. <laughs> those things like court i used to be a courtroom artist actually yeah. and i was terrible at it but yeah just aging him a year and being the slightest little dip in the jawline might cause him to look too old or mm. too much sharp brow bone might make him look too angry or so it's drawing a face is a pretty delicate thing when you're trying to make a character of a specific character, the monsters, the or the the like Dobby, the house elf, those guys, the goblins, and all that, that was 
a lot of more fun for me to draw because it was more free and scary and goofy. And But I was very kind of uptight about drawing Harry and Hermione and Ron just because yeah. the spotlight. And when you're working on something so famous, <clears throat> it's there's a lot of pressure to do it right because you get a lot of criticism from a lot of fans. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I remember, I yeah, after... I must have been like, I had drawn maybe the first book out and it was, people were liking it and stuff. And then Nickelodeon wanted a cover of, that showed Harry up close. And it was the first up close portrait I have done of him. Other, I think I maybe had done two books and they were both, Harry's head was about that book on, big on each cover. And now all of a sudden Nickelodeon wanted me to do a full size face of him on their cover, their magazine cover. So I did. And I made his eyes, I think I made them brown. And, and it was published and it came out. And then I showed, I was doing a slideshow at some school. I did a lot of presentations. And when I showed the Nickelodeon cover up on the big screen, some of the kids were gasping. <gasps> what did you do to Harry's eyes? And I said, what? <laughs> you what know, you're not supposed to be they're not supposed to be brown they're supposed to be green and I didn't I missed that part in the description I forgot that I guess they were supposed to be green that's what Rowling said but I had made them brown and the kids were all upset about it and it got published that way and I realized I better read things more carefully I better really pay attention to details so yeah the <laughs> fans could be tough but oh they, yeah they were loyal fans so yeah, that's awesome. And and that's I always thought that was a that's a hard task to take on when you have a character and you have to age them up because like you said, it's even though you know that character and you're familiar with them, you still have to make it seem like yeah. it's not too because I've done that with like little stuff I used to draw with my little comic books I used to make and I was like I want to make them look older, but I don't really know how. And I used to think when I was younger, if I just threw a beard on them, if it was a guy, <laughs> then it would automatically tell you, hey, they're older. It's That's really dope that you were able to figure that out. I don't know yeah. that I was very good at it, though. Yeah. I, yeah, It's almost like I wish I would have had a neighbor or a brother yeah. <laughs> or a model, and I could have just yeah. drawn them every year. Yeah. You know? But the fact that you did it without any references to like that and you nailed it that's still great a lot of people definitely appreciate that as like you said because those fans are still loyal and they hold it near and dear because i didn't get to i didn't get to read in any of the books because my grandmother was like a whole it was a whole thing but she didn't allow it so i just have to gloss at the covers because i'm a big that's how i love comic books i'm a big cover guy with books yeah. from any genre any kind of medium and I used to be like, oh, that's so awesome and stuff. Yeah. It's a it's an eye catcher thing. Yeah. That just shows you how much your work was like impactful on us, other kids. We enjoy it either that's way. Cool. No matter what anybody said, we enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. I've done like I brought a couple books tonight. I don't know. Like this one was oh, about that is, that is that's awesome. Kandinsky, the abstract painter oh, Kandinsky, when he was okay. going to the he had this condition to call Anna of I forgot what it's called. But when he saw color, he heard music. And when he heard music, he would see color. And it was very real oh, to wow. him. And so that's why his abstract painting developed into this real, it, it, it looks musical. His abstract painting is, I don't know if you're familiar with Kandinsky, but there's a piece in here that is kind of like his pieces. Like this is like one of his pieces. Oh, wow. Yes. There's a lot of like geometric things that move Shapes. around. There's a lot yeah. of movement. And so it's real musical in it. And a lot of jazz musicians refer to his work actually when they talk about their music being visual. Anyway, that I don't know why I brought that up, but <clears throat> that was another character that a like, young boy who kind of I guess reminded me of Harry in some way. But yeah, it's been fun having different kinds of children's books and different subject matter. Yeah. And so, and and it's in a way it's such a important part of like you said of reading because those books. I like the first thing you get, that's how you learn how to read, or that might be how you get into art, or how you get into writing, or just any kind of development in that medium, and it's, it's really awesome, because as growing up as a child, I used to, I love, and I still do, I love to read books, so 
if if a cover caught my eye, if a title, anything, I wanted to read it. So the fact that you can you you can make those different types of books and covers and stuff is awesome. And just from you showing us that right there, when you showed it, I immediately thought about jazz music because it's a lot of jazz paintings that look like that. So yeah, that that was awesome enough to share with us. So. Yeah, it's, it's love children's book, and that is something too that I do want to like get into, like writing writing children's books and stuff. Because I have a niece and nephew now, so I want to have them to have something to look forward to. Yeah, How it's really a great. They, my niece will be six this year, and my nephew will be one. Oh, so yes. you got some time with him? Yes, I got some time, so I'm yeah. definitely I definitely want to get into that. <laughs> That's cool. Yes. Yeah, for sure, for sure. But I just always love the, just the process of, or just the format of just the covers of children's books, because it's very important that the children's book is welcoming. It's yeah. The illustration is welcoming. It doesn't, it isn't, I don't know. I just think it's interesting how it's definitely a talent to be able to create a children's book cover and make it crawling enough that a child will be interested in reading it. And it's just also interesting in how I'm able to remember all those covers back when I was a little kid. Yes. And what was just the process of being able to make sure that the cover is just eye-catching? When I was a little kid, that's a great question. Because when I was doing those Potter covers, that I had to ask myself that question. How can I make this eye-catching? And you have to consider your audience. It's not just the parents who are buying the books for the kids. It's the kids. You want them to be engaged with the book. And so one of the things that I wanted to do was to include things in the cover that were hidden, half hidden and tucked away that were in the story somewhere. So maybe part of an owl wing would be sticking out from behind a curtain or a key would be on the floor, just an old key floating somewhere. Or if you look at that first cover, especially, there's a lot of things that are in the cover that are from different chapters of the book. And so when you look at the cover, you go, wow, there's, look, there's a three-headed dog there. We wonder what that's about. And it's meant to kind of pique your interest and you want to read the book to find out I want to read about that dog. I want to find out where that is or where's, what's that key? What door does that key open? And so just little hints like that become like a puzzle to solve for kids. Kids love puzzles and mysteries. So I tried to do that on the covers and that's a lot to figure out because the covers are wrap around. So that's there's a back and a front and then there's a flap too that flaps around. And so You have to design the image so that it's complete on each half, but yet it blends together when it's unfolded. And you have to pay attention to where the type on the, on the, the, what do you call this? The spine. The spine, yeah. Yeah. What, what happens to that? Is that part of the art or is it just a graphic thing? So I always tried to make the covers when you unfolded them look like one piece but that there was a focus on each part and the spine was part of the blended two together. So there's so much to think about. And then the type was hand lettered on all of them and they they took a lot of time and they did to think about. And pastels, I don't even use pastels anymore. They're so clean. I use oil pastels, but Uh, yeah. That's, it's interesting though that you did those in pastels because I've used I used pastels a couple of times and it's really aggravating to deal with because yeah. <laughs> you have to spray it and stuff so it won't smudge after a while and all that so that that you did a great job with using pastels because that's a tough like medium to use and art. you don't know what you're doing. I used them since I was like five five years oh, old. Yeah, so it's a walk in the park there. Yeah, yeah. but. Even then, when I was using pastels when I was younger, like I just got the, just the, I just got marks everywhere, marks on my hands <laughs> and <laughs> marks on my, yeah, and some kind of how I got marks on my nose and in my hair. And if I was to still use pastels, if I would still use pastels today, I'd probably be no different. I'd probably just some kind of how get a mark on my nose and my hair. Yeah, so. they're pretty <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, it's definitely a talent to be able to create art in that medium and 
what do you we're mean? talking a little oh what do i use now yeah oh i mostly just use digital just digital art tools like uh-huh. i might use like some type of application on my it's like an application on my computer or on my tablet and that's mostly how i draw nowadays and mm-hmm. if not that i draw traditionally just on paper with pencil but i'm new to the digital art and i just recently learned how to use it more in the past over the past few years but as far as painting is concerned i might paint things like a model car or I might paint like a model plane or something along the lines of that. But that's about as far as it goes for painting. I haven't really done like you with abstract painting or whatever, whatever, stuff like that. But as far as abstract work is concerned, I never really been, I don't know. I never really been good with abstract because I think too much. (laughs) And I just can't really. (laughs) Yeah, yeah I just, it's just kind of hard for me to be able to just freeform like the stuff that you do. It's kind of, it's a little difficult for me. Yeah, yeah. No, I get what you're saying. Yeah. And I'm yeah, the total. Yeah, go ahead. Also, I was just going to say, I'm the total opposite. I love abstracts. Like, I got, I probably got some stuff in here somewhere, but yeah, I go crazy with it. I love it. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, even stuff that's free and loose can be hard to do. I like that the hard way. Yeah. <laughs> yes, definitely. yeah, but also also along the lines of producing art and other mediums, I know you also create stock monkeys. I do. I love it. <laughs> I should run and get one, except they're in the house. I don't have one here. Yeah, I love it. You know, when when it was when COVID was at its at its awful point. And people were actually staying in their houses and stuff. And the election was going on and it was getting tense because, (laughs) because it Mm -hmm. was, and I couldn't go into the studio and paint because I was too, I was just too, too tense, I guess, with between COVID and certain politicians and and so I decided I had to have another creative outlet and so I was my, our grandson had just been born and I'm not a quilter I'm not a grandma who quilts and so I had to figure out what am I going to make for my grandson his other grandmothers are making him quilts what can I make he won't want an abstract painting he's just a baby so I thought I'm going to make a sock monkey so I just went online and learned how to try to figure out how to make a sock monkey and do you guys know what sock monkeys are? Yes, yeah, I mean, just, course, yeah. A lot of young people don't know. Oh yeah, we know. We had I had my great great grandmother. She's she did like a lot of quilts and sewing she? and stuff. Yeah, okay. yeah. She had she used to have quilts and stuff around the house. So yeah, I definitely I know what a sock monkey is. <laughs> okay, okay, cool. So I wanted to make them different than the traditional ones. So I wanted to make them really colorful and patterned, and crazy. And so I ordered a whole bunch of cheap socks online, like men's socks. For some reason, men's socks are just more colorful and patterned and more fun than women's socks. I don't know why. Yeah. <laughs> that's the only fun part of the th- stuff they wear oftentimes like suits ties and then fun socks ordered a bunch of socks and started making them and they just they became a really fun satisfying calming thing for me during kind of a ten- tense time and I made them and and I started to auction one off every month for Feeding America and I and, and people liked them and Feeding America was great to work with because every dollar you make buys 10 meals so if a monkey sold for 500 bucks that would be 5,000 meals and so it's really cool to to make something fun and then people could eat some food it was pretty cool yes that's awesome yeah and so I'm still I still want to make sack monkeys because they're just so much fun and it's just fun seeing something come to life three-dimensionally when you're used to working two-dimensional. Mm. My husband's a sculptor now that he's retired from teaching, and uh, he's found a lot of joy in going from his two-dimensional line drawing work to creating these really cool wood sculptures in the workshop. He, our garage has turned into a workshop, and uh, he's really good. But 
Yeah, going from two dimensional to three dimensional is really fun. So the monkeys were that for me too. Yes. It's kind of fun. So yeah, definitely. But like you were saying, with this, this creating the sock monkeys and just making them super duper colorful. Because yeah. I had a sock monkey when I was younger, but it is it's more, it's just, yeah, like basically I had it when I was. I had it when I was, I remember I had it when I was six and I lost it when I was like nine, but uh -huh. I probably just broke it because it more or less just looked like a, it mostly just looked like a, a, just a regular monkey, but I was just, I remember just throwing it around everywhere, <laughs> but <laughs> <laughs> I've never seen any sock monkeys design the way that you designed them. They're, they're definitely really eye-catching. Thanks. There's one here that I posted not too long ago. She's actually my favorite monkey. Oh, yes. Oh, wow. she, I love that one. Yeah, she. her name is Rain. She was the April, or yeah, she was the April monkey. So I auctioned her off in April. I don't know if you know the term April showers brings May flowers. Yes, because I'm an April baby. So. Are you an April baby? <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, that's sweet. So that, that thing around her neck, I don't know if you can see it. It's like a cloud. It's a cloud. And then yeah. the little, yeah. uh, little beads, that silver beads all over her body that look like raindrops. That is amazing. I love that. I love yeah. I really do. Yeah. 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 See, those are great. Like Josh said, I just remember the simple ones that was just... Yeah, well, that gray, yeah, that gray monkey, and it just said, <laughs> "Yeah, my mom." Yeah, those are the kinds my mom made. Yeah, that's how I. That's how I remember them because she would make them, and sell them to just help put food on the table. But yeah, they're fun. It's nice to find something that you can do that's just fun, and it doesn't make you crazy with pressure, or you don't have to sell them. You don't have to. People don't have to like them. Nobody's judging them. You just make them because they're fun. Yeah. Yeah. When you get older, you look for stuff like that. <laughs> you guys are too young to... <laughs> yeah, you're only like 25 anyway. Exactly. You're not that old. <laughs> I feel like I'm, I feel like I'm like 45. Okay. 45. That's what we're going to say. We're going to keep it right there. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes. Yeah, but definitely. And also just one more closing thing that I just kind of wanted to understand is just what would be some advice for an aspiring artist that might want to be able to have the opportunity of producing art on a similar premise, like just producing art for children's books or just producing art in general for a company or just basically, what would be some good advice for somebody that's just trying to become a professional artist and be able to thrive in that profession? I can only give advice based on what I know worked for me. And it was a different time then. We didn't have computers working as much as we do now. I mean, there were computers, but people weren't relying on digital, digitally produced work. But that's really neither here nor there. I think the best advice I could give somebody would be to make art that makes you happy. And if that's book that, or art that would look good in a children's book, then that's great. And like what I was talking about before is finding your style and making sure that it feels good and it's comfortable for you to make that art. It feels real and it feels right to you. And you're not trying to make it look like somebody else's work. You're really just trying to find what works for you and to really hone that and really find tune it that takes time so my best advice is just to keep working on that to work really hard at that and once in a while show somebody who you trust that maybe either whose whose art that you admire somebody who who's also an artist or somebody who works with books or even librarians who see a lot of books get some outside input and you don't have to take it to heart but just listen and listen to see to, to find out what people see in your work. Because if you're going to be doing children's books or work for other people, you're going to, you're going to have to appeal to them somehow. And just take it in and take notes. 
and then go back to the drawing board and keep pushing what you do best. And then when you're ready to go out there and show your work, find the right platform and show a lot of people and just keep at it. You just keep at it and you oh, don't. That's great advice. That's put in simple have, terms. Yeah. Have confidence, right? Yes, and definitely. Think positive. Don't give up. Gosh, I got so many rejections. I remember laying on the sofa in my cold apartment that I could barely pay for. <laughs> I remember thinking, this sucks. I don't think I can do this. Yeah. And then saying to myself, no, I have to do this because I'm not yeah. going to win any more tables. I have to do this. That's right. But you have to be willing to go through the crappy part because you learn from that and you learn stamina and you learn strength from that. Yes. So use that and just keep at it. Right? Yes, there it is. Oh, uh, from, from a legend herself. No, nah, I'm not a legend. Oh, oh yes, you are. Grandma who makes monkeys and <laughs> <laughs> hey look, that's a legend in itself. So all grandmas are legends, no matter what you do. Y'all are right. y'all are legends. We love y'all. Y'all make us who we are. So that's right. That makes you a legend either that's way. Right. <laughs> you be grandfathers, and yes. you'll be legends in your time. You yes. are legends. Yes, I, we appreciate that. We really do. We greatly <laughs> appreciate it. <laughs> Definitely. Thank you. Thank it's you for that. It's been fun getting to know you and chatting. Yes, it's been a great chat with you. And uh, just before you go, is there anything, you know, that you're working on that you got coming up or you just want to share with us, with the with our viewers and stuff? I just, um, I'm not really working. I'm working on that stuff for the Parkinson's poems. And, okay. But in uh, maybe six month time, you might find that somewhere. It's going to be in a book form. Oh. Keep an eye. It's a book of poems. Yeah. Yes. I love poems. So I'll definitely be looking out for that. Yes. Okay. Definitely. Definitely. All right. But um, but yeah, but yeah. Thanks for coming out, Miss Grand Prix. And before we close out the show, I just like everybody to introduce themselves just before we close everything out. I've been your host, Joshua Singleton. Um, your co-host, Marcus Long. And I'm your guest, Mary Grand Prix. And this is the Square Roundtable Podcast, and we are out.